tonight, I'm going to invite uh, Christine and Alicia uh, to come on over, and, and they are going to share uh, their testimony and with, with all of us. Well, let's give them every support. Uh, they are not used to speaking publicly, and they are not people who want to come up even to, to speak in front of people. But I said to them, you do have a testimony to share. Share it. Okay, well, let's give them all the support, Christine and Alicia. My name is Christine. We are so glad to see everyone taking time to join us here at Bethel Family Camp to have fellowship and to learn God's word together. Uh, maybe you might be wondering why we are chosen to share the family camp together. This combination looks a bit weird. <laughs> Actually, myself also wondering about this. It seems like we don't have much in common. And there is also an age gap between us, as you can see. <laughs> I think Chris, do you know why? Uh, uh I also don't know why. <laughs> Actually, we are just joking. Um, you might not realize, but Auntie Christine and I have a very good relationship. We also or we always make fun of each other because we are good friends. When we found out we are sharing together, no doubt for sure, trust me, both of us are really nervous and scared. But at the same time, we are very grateful to have this opportunity to testify his goodness together, to serve him together in this family camp, and most importantly, learning this world together. I remember that the first time we got to know each other was because of a friend of mine who is a, a Mandarin speaking person. Uh, I knew Alicia was in the translation team for uh, in Mandarin. And I was hoping that together we can share the gospel with her. We also hope that in sharing that gospel, God will bring a special comfort to her heart uh, at a difficult time when she lost her only child. Since then, we have seen how God has also blossomed our wonderful friendship together. Thank God indeed. Despite our age gap and differences, we have built a wonderful friendship through ministry. We will not take this for granted. Let us commit our time to God and pray together. Let's pray. Mm -hmm. Dear Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you, brought, you have provided to us. We thank you for your journey mercy that we are able to be here today, gathered together, and to be able to study your words together. Father, we commit this time into your hands. May you bless us as we begin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Pray this. A few weeks ago, I watched a very inspiring movie where the actress is also the director of the movie. She has dedicated a year of time to lose weight. And she successfully had lost over 50 kg, from 100 kg to just over 50 kg for the sake of the God of this movie. What struck me the most is to see how difficult and the child challenging her life is. There is no one to support her and she has no one to talk to. Her boyfriend cheated on her and married her best friend. When she thought she found her true love, her true love did not acknowledge her because she is bad. And even her closest family member took advantage of her kindness. All this had led her to thinking that she should just end her life because no one loved her in this world. I could deeply sense her despair and pain at that moment. The scene has sent then stay in my mind after I returned home. I was asking myself, what would I do if I had at the position or I even have experienced similar challenges in my life? My immediate response is to give thanks to God for the blessing and the privilege that I have to be a child of God. Despite all my imperfections, I am confident that he will still love me. I do not have to be afraid to face all the challenges in my life alone because God has promised to be our refuge, 
our strength and our help at all times. In my 12 years of living in Australia, I may not have faced challenges like how the actress did, but life is undeniably challenging. One of the valuable lessons that I have learned during this time is the need to pray. In Psalm 37, verse 3 to 5, it's a reminder to me and it reads, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desire of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Through prayer, I've learned to rely on him and look upon him. To bring my problem before him and to commit everything to him. Of course, the problems will not disappear immediately after praise and we will have to still face all the problems and challenges in life. But I have learned and experienced that God will lead me in His way to guide me with His word and to comfort me when life is not its best. I recall my final year in university when I struggled very much with one particular subject. I feel like giving up during that time. I told myself that it was okay. Thinking could always retake the subject and extend my study by another semester. However, plans can never keep up with changes. Suddenly, the Australian government changed its policy, which means the visa I intended to apply for would be replaced by a different visa. What does this mean to me? This means that I needed to pass my exam and graduate to qualify the visa. At that time, I was really close to breaking down, feeling helpless, my chest feels like it's being pressed by a last one. Many nights I was unable to sleep. Yet, once again, I had experienced God's grace. Not only did I pass the job set, but I did exceptionally well. In Ephesians chapter 3, 20, it reads, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Truly, God's grace exceeds all that we can ask or imagine. If I had stuck to my initial plan and delayed graduation, I would not be here today. Well, I am not considered myself a clever or talented. I didn't have a big dream. I am deeply aware of God's guiding hand in my life. Looking back at myself, 12 years ago, I came to birth with just a sweet case. I am grateful for the help and care my family has extended to me. Although I cannot claim that my life is perfectly aligned or without any challenges at present, but I have lack of nothing. I have been blessed with a stable job that provides for my needs, a comfortable life, loving families, and the ability to support my parents. Reflecting on my journey so far, I am always amazed by how wonderful God is. I'm deeply thankful to God for the opportunity He has given to me to serve Him. I never take this for granted. Even though I may not be able to exit in a major way, I humbly hope that in everything I do, I can glorify His name. The hymn 67, The Love of God, is a song I've chosen today. It beautifully expresses God's wonderful love. The first sentence reads, The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. Indeed, God's love surpasses all we can ask or imagine. Deserving all praises for His name. Let us praise our God with grateful hearts.
if all of us here who has re responded to being at family camp are truly honest, we can all agree wholeheartedly that we have tasted the goodness, the sweetness and the kindness of God through his servants at battle. I sum up all of these wonderful experiences in one word, love. Yes, much love has been shown to battle church of our living God. How was it shown? One, by the leadership. The leadership never flaunted status nor power as in the worldview, but has displayed, demonstrated servanthood, God's kingdom view, always preaching, teaching, and encouraging, not only in word, but so much more in deed, spiritual and physical food, setting an example of Christ that we too may be able to follow. Secondly, God's people, in a way that the young people serve tirelessly and harmoniously together, giving of their time and energy in the various ministries of the church, in children's ministry, on the website PA, in choir, in cleaning, in washing up, and so much more. I am ever conscious, thirdly, God is the one who builds the church and brings us together as his dwelling place. We are the body of Christ. In Ephesians 2, 19-22, we are being told that we are no longer strangers and foreigners, but we're actually fellow members of the church of, uh, of the household of God. We are built up together on the foundation upon which Christ Jesus himself is the chief cornerstone, in whom, in whom the whole building fitted together, grows together into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom we are also being built up together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. It is in this kind of love that I see, I hear and taste it, that I also caught the same spirit of love, without which I would not be able to share the gospel of our Lord with some dear friends of mine. The bonds of friendship forged by our common faith in Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour. Presently, I have an aged care resident friend and another who lived at home, had cancer. At the time when I was writing the testimony, she was ready to go home with the Lord. However, she's now just passed away less than a week ago. Other friends I have befriended in the past three years as a volunteer in aged care have also since passed away with their parting words to me every day when I'm there. God willing, I will see you next week. But if not, we will meet again at the feet of Jesus. How and what did I share with them to encourage their faith in the Lord through their pains and their sorrows? in health, in loneliness, feeling useless, feeling not valued anymore. As I hear the preaching and teaching of the word at battle, I was able to share and encourage them with a timely word that uplifted them to seek God so much more in prayer. Secondly, lovingly showed loads of patience and kindness with all sincerity and humility as I have received and tasted them in the reality of the lives of God's servants in battle and Bethany. A few people have told me that they see God in me, and if they did, I thank God for His grace. Thirdly, not preparing what I had to say, but listening and trusting the Holy Spirit's leading, who brings to remembrance all things the Lord has said through the pulpit messages. For that, I thank God. And, fourth, and fourthly, I hold before me always, always what the Lord said in John 13, 13 to 17. If he truly is my Lord, I will serve humbly in everything and towards everyone as he has clearly set this as, as an example for me by washing his disciples' feet. I, a wretched sinner saved by grace, am eternally grateful, unworthy servant to my Lord, who saved me from eternal condemnation to eternal life with God. Sometimes it gets a bit hard, especially when I found myself unwell and with no energy, 
but I realized the needs of others are far greater than my own. They are elderly, with, no, with not much strength left, not much time left on this earth. I thank God for equipping me with sufficient strength for each day's needs. I thank God that this is the manna, the sustenance from heaven, which I collect every day through prayer and supplication for the filling of the Holy Spirit with joy to be completely shared by the end of the day. It was never meant to be held back for myself. Otherwise, it will rot. How? Humility will go and pride and arrogance will enter the heart. That's not something that I would like to have. I dread that. For I know I will collect tomorrow again fresh and wonderful manna for each day's needs, for that day's needs. Never too much, always just enough. Sufficient as the Lord calls me to a work He gives me by His grace each day. In this, I thank God again and again for making me a vessel of honour in His house, though I may only be just wood or clay. I would like to share a little poem that I penned back in 2017. The inspiration was from the reading and listening to the Bethany online messages on the teachings of Jesus from Matthew 5-7 to by Pastor Charlie. Here goes. Love cannot just be taught. Love needs very much to be caught. John was once called a son of thunder. Boy, did he have a terrible temper. Later, John became an apostle of love. Not because he knew how to love. He called himself a disciple whom Jesus loves. Not because Jesus loves John more. While some seeing love were blind, and others, hearing love, were deaf. Many, having been loved, have also strayed. Judas Iscariot, though well loved, the Lord he betrayed. The disciples took a while to fathom the love of Christ. But John, the love of Christ, caught with great delight. The God of love, later John would write, in his gospel and epistles, he pointed out the glorious light. The song I have chosen tonight is hymn 292, God of Grace and God of Glory.
begin it with a prayer together that we are going to try to understand this. Our Father, we pray for grace and for wisdom to understand what is known as a doctrine of the church, ecclesiology. We pray that you will help us to have a very strong, clear, sound, correct understanding of this doctrine of the church. We pray for grace and wisdom to be enlightened. We pray that you will help us to fathom what the church is all about and then to understand how we can respond to this teaching. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. If I were to ask you, <clears throat> how would you actually define the doctrine of the church? I can almost tell you that we will end up with many, many different, almost conflicting ideas as to what the church is all about. I'm seriously. See, one of the challenges that we're going to try to do, uh, what I call goals, is to help us to ask ourselves seriously, do we have a fully biblical comprehension of the doctrine of the church? And I don't think that too many of us can say, yes, I fully understand the biblical teaching, doctrine of this thing we call the church. Right? What is it? Well, I, I'm trying to argue for a biblical comprehension of things versus a personal understanding of the church. See, all of us have almost depending upon where we came from. We all have our own ideas of what the church is all about. Wherever we come from, you will find that we all have different, almost, ideas or views of the church. And we actually have no idea what is the real doctrine of the church. How would you define this doctrine of the church anyway? Right? And you, you'll find that it's very, very difficult. And it's something that we need to think through very carefully. So I'm going to try to present to you a biblical doctrine. And be, being a biblical doctrine, I need to trace with you the original ideas. And you'll find that these ideas are actually, it doesn't come from men in any way, all right? So I want to suggest to you the first thought, but it's not in your notes right now, is that we should look at the church in its complexity versus its simplicity. See, the problem is we all think that um, it's all straightforward, you know, just like uh, if you look at a person who say, we are all accountants are mathematicians. Actually, that's not true. There are lots and lots of things to look at, not just numbers. See, that's how we tend to simplify the church. But a real understanding of the church is actually to understand that it is there is complexity, not simplicity. And because we don't have a complex understanding of the, of the church, in a very simple way, we just think, I come to church, I'm baptized, I'm a member, that's it. You know, if that's what it is, then the church is actually nothing more than a social organization. But is the church a social organization? 
And the answer is, is not. You see the, the whole, whole challenge of it all, right? So we sometimes oversimplify things, right? So a person says, okay, uh, the person is a teacher. Uh, he just teaches in the school, go home, that's it. You wish that's true. It's not. So what is the complexity? I, I want to present to you a complexity rather than a simplicity. Because a simplicity has caused the church to be really befuddled. Absolutely. Unfortunately. And this has become a very, very basic problem. And we're going to try to look at complexity. Right? So it's not our church as such. It's not you know, um, the denominational idea. See, when you look at the church and you look at it, it's denominational. It's sort of, okay, you are Presbyterians and you are Methodists and you are Anglicans and you are Baptists and, uh, you know, whatever you want to call it. And we think that's the church. What if we're all wrong? What if the church is not to be measured by what you think it is. All right? So this is the first thought I want to send out to us all and to, to look at this whole idea. Look at a church as a complex thing. The moment I have a simple approach, I have a simplicity of heart and mind, I'm already missing the point. All right? Now, this is important. For example, well, let, let's look, take a look at your notes and all. it's uh, found on page 17 now, right? Many people think that the church, you know, there are writers out there, they think that the church began with the Apostle Paul. Now, there are books written. The church began with the Apostle Paul. That's not true. Right? The idea of the church was actually not even known. Let's take a look at the first text that we are looking at. All right? So we are looking at two elements right now. What is known as a prophetic element? Right? A prophetic element is found here, Isaiah 28 and verse 16. So we read, thus says the Lord God. So the person who actually gave the idea of what the church was meant to be was actually the Lord himself. Not man, not a social idea, and very frankly, Isaiah preached to people who never understood this. He ministered for the longest time. One of the very long-lasting uh, prophets. But believe me, if you read Isaiah, you begin to realize how complex that book really is. So when he wrote, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. And I'll tell you this, nobody understood a word that he said. That, that's true. Right? So what is this concept of Zion? Now, a lot of people confuse uh, and they think that this Zion is simply Jerusalem and Israel. But actually, it's far greater than that. Right? Now, this was a prophetic word. So if we do not understand prophecy properly, we probably cannot understand the church either. So long before the idea of the church was even existing, it was already prophetically stated. So when we look at the church in existence, 
is actually a fulfillment of prophecy. So when the Lord Jesus said, I will build my church, he was actually fulfilling a prophecy. Now, this is a vital starting point. Right? A social organization is not prophetic. It just happens. Right? But once we understand a prophecy, and the focus of that prophecy is no less than the Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Now, this is important. All right? So, he is called a foundational stone. He is called a trite stone. He is called a precious cornerstone. He is called a sure foundation. Now, watch this next last line. Whoever believes will not act hastily. What's that all about? Who were, who is that? See, that's how prophecy works. Nobody understood it properly. Who were the ones who acted hastily? The scribes, the Pharisees, the chief priests, the high priest. Because they did not believe, because they did not understand, they acted hastily. Attacked the Lord Jesus, brought about his death to their own judgment at the end of it all. That was what happened. So when the Lord Jesus was trying to do something, build something, is actually already there. Right? So the church, the basis of it all, the foundation of it all, has to be one who can fulfill this. And nobody else can fulfill this except the Lord Jesus. As a foundation, as a trite stone, precious cornerstone, sure foundation, and there must be belief in Him. So if I really believe in the Lord Jesus as the prophetic person who will form the foundation of the church. The next challenge would be, do I believe? So if I don't really believe in the Lord Jesus, in all of these statements, I'm stuck because we are going to act hastily, wrongly. That is a problem. And a lot of people, when it comes to the church, right, they don't realize what they say can be said too hastily. What they do, they can end up with, am I doing it too hastily? And the answer is very much so, yes. And that's where we can go wrong. That's where we can make terrible mistakes. And that's where things can go wrong terribly. That is something we need to bear in mind. So the prophetic element has to be understood first. All right? Now, then we come to what we call a messianic element, where the messianic element um, sort of complements the prophetic element. All right? So this is a complementary idea. When we say complementary, it, in other words, it does not sub, uh, subtract from it, it actually adds to it. Right? So we read in Psalm 118, the stone which the builders rejected. Can you see this? They acted hastily. And they rejected. Right? So when you reject the Lord, it's the same acting hastily you reject it. You may be builders and you reject. The Lord's prophecy will still be fulfilled. The Lord Jesus is still the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. To those who believe, it is marvelous in our eyes. 
Right? So we are looking at two things. First, am I really a believer? Right? If I really believe in the Word of God, in prophecy, in the Lord Jesus, and God's place for the Lord Jesus to be the cornerstone, the foundation of the church, one, I will not act hastily. I will not do anything hastily. Why? Because it involves the church. My faith in the Lord will teach me I cannot do it hastily. Can't. Right? Now, this is absolutely important. And when we look at what the work of the church is, then we begin to realize how marvelous it is in our eyes. I, I look at the church today, right, in our churches, since our perspective is our, our family of churches, you know, you cannot but see how marvelous it is that God is working in the hearts, in the midst of all our churches. That, that's something that's just absolutely wonderful. Right. Easter time, for us over in Bethany, it's 860 people gathered at Shangri-La. For India, would be all the churches who are gathered there, well over a thousand people. They all meet in different places. And that's yourself, 200-something people. And you put them all together. We are more than 2,000 people together. And how do we see this? It is marvelous in our eyes. Because we are seeing this is the Lord's doing. Can you see what I'm trying to say? So I don't have a my personal perspective. I don't have a traditional understanding. My understanding of the church is through eyes of faith, seeing what the Lord is doing, focusing on the Lord Jesus and the message of Easter. The Lord is risen. That's how we want to understand it. That's where we begin. So our perspective of the church begins with the Lord, His word of prophecy, His foretelling, His foretelling, the fulfillment of it all. And if I can see the church along these lines, I will see it quite differently. Right? So I, I won't see it as, what's the program? I will be asking, what is the Lord doing? And with eyes of faith, I will, you know, I will rejoice in this very much. And to me, that is absolutely wonderful. Right? So now we're going to take a look at the idea of how the Lord Jesus begins to fulfill what was predicted, what was prophesied a long time ago. So we turn to page 18. In page 18, we see what the Lord Jesus Christ said. Okay, so if you're going to take a look at uh, Matthew 16, the, the text is there written for you. Right? Now, it is very, very important for us to ask ourselves, what the Lord Jesus meant. So he said to his disciples, okay, from all your uh, talking to people, from all that they have said to you, what do the people say I am? Well, some said, well, maybe you're Elijah the prophet. Maybe you are the John the baptizer uh, risen from the dead. You, you, one of the prophets. But nobody said that he was the Christ until Peter. And then Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now watch this very carefully. The Lord Jesus answered and said to him, Simon Bayona, you are blessed. For God, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, my Father who is in heaven. 
Now watch this very carefully. Now we talk about those who believe, right? They will not act hastily. But those who believe, there is a very special work that involves God's revealing His truth to us. And Peter didn't understand this. But God was working in the heart, in the mind of Peter. Suddenly, Peter understood who the Lord Jesus is. And the Lord Jesus explained this. Peter, you did not come to this understanding by reasoning. You did not come to this understanding because you're smart. But because God the Father has revealed this to you. Now, this is a marvelous thought to bear in mind. He has, you see, this is an understanding of the church, of the Lord Jesus. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try to explain this to you a little bit more. All right. So if, for example, you can understand and perceive what the church is, and you can understand who the Lord Jesus Christ is in the context of the church. Not by reasoning, but suddenly it's revealed to you. You know what you, are, what you are saying. That is a special work of the Spirit of God through whom God the Father works. Right? So if I were to look at the work of the church, if I see the development of the church, if I see, understand what the church is all about, there is actually a special work of God the Father inside us. So if you were to ask yourself, how do I understand the church? And if you use reasoning, you, it's not the same as revelation. And God will reveal this to you. You know what you are doing? This is a special work of God. Built upon the Lord Jesus. Revealed by the Spirit of God. Those who believe will never act hastily. Whatever I do, I think, I plan, I do it. That's how we plan our church. We do not have a last minute, let's do Easter. Everything is planned. Our belief in God will never cause us to do hastily. Won't. Can't. Not possible. Right? Now, this is something that uh, really, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just really, really thankful for. Because there is a work of God, the Father, which is really precious. We can't see it, but you can see this is the Father revealing things to you. Now, we go on further to look at verse 18, which a lot of people have not understood. Right? So, and the Lord Jesus Christ, I say to you, you are Petros. That's his name in Greek. You are Petros. Now watch, listen to me very carefully. And then he said, on this rock, Petra. Many people think the Lord Jesus built the church on Peter. Not correct. Why? Because two words were used. Peter, you are a rock, small one. You cannot build a massive thing on a small rock, Petros. I will build this church upon Petra, the rock. Foundation. Go back to Isaiah 28. A sure foundation, a tried stone. This is the rock that we are talking about. All right? So you need to connect Matthew 16 with 
Psalm 118 and Isaiah 28 because they are wonderfully connected. This is not the church built on Peter, as some people would like to think. Right? Linguistically erroneous. Theologically erroneous. This rock, this Petra we are talking about, is already very clearly state, stated there. This is the rock that the Lord will build on it. Right? Now, why is this so important? Because the Lord Jesus mentioned that the gates of Hades will attack the church, but will not prevail. Now, look at the idea of the expression of the gates of Hades. Literally, what it means, the gates of hell will open. And all the gates will attack the church. And you know what? They will. Now, that is what the Lord Jesus is going to uh, give a special word to the Peter and all the, uh, the disciples. You cannot build it. You cannot build a church on a human being. You have to build it upon the church. Those who have faith will not act hastily. There we go. Right? And those who see with eyes of faith will see this is marvelous in our eyes because it is the work of the Lord. This is the doing of the Lord. So as I look at the church, I don't see it as my church. I don't see it as our denomination. I see the Lord, His hand, His word, His prophecy fulfilled in the church. Now if I look at God's work like this, I stand in awe of God's work. I will not do things hastily. Right? I made a commitment to serve the Lord and the church over 50 years ago. Will not flinch from it. Because this is the Lord's work. This is marvelous in our eyes. This is the work of God. The church is God's work. And when people try to hurt the church in any way, we are reminded the gates of hell will not prevail. Now, this is absolutely important. Who is building the church? The Lord Jesus is. The Father is. The Spirit of God is. And if that is God's work, I want to be a part of it. And I will build the church. I will do everything I can to build that church. Because this is the Lord's church. Now this is something that is very special and precious to my heart. So I ask myself, do I, have, do I have a correct understanding of the church as such? Because if I don't have it, then I have missed the points of it all. What is that church? Right? Now this is absolutely important. This is why we read in on page 18, this is why Paul understood this. And he said to the Corinthian church, if ever a church was attacked by the gates of hell, Hades, the Corinthian church was. It was the most afflicted church of all. There were problems within, there were problems without. A lot of people don't realize that in, if they are not building the church, but they are hurting the church, they are part of the gates of Hades. That is how serious it is. That's how it works. If we are not building it, then what are we doing? 
Right? Because the Lord himself said, I will build my church. And I will build it so strongly, the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So you must ask yourself, am I building the church? Now, every week you must ask, am I building the church further? Am I committed to building the church as the Lord Jesus is? This is where we start. Now, this is absolutely important. Right? Now, this is something that we understand um, the work of, of the church. So, Paul called the Corinthian church to remind them, 1 Corinthians 1, and he says he's writing to the church, in, we read, to the church of God. It just happened to be in Corinth. So if I'm speaking, I am speaking to the church of God, happened to be in Perth. The church of God in Kenya. The church of God in India. The church of God in Singapore. But it is the church of God. It is not our church. Now this is a very important biblical understanding of what the church is all about. So you ask yourself, what am I doing? See, many people, I'll, I'll come and serve. Oh, wait a minute. We're not interested in your service, actually. More in your understanding. How do you view the church? Do I see it as the church of God? Do I see it as a prophecy being fulfilled? Do I see the work of God there? Is it marvelous in my eyes? Because if I can't see this, what's my service for? What's my service all about? Now that is important. Right? So this is what we want to try to do and help people to understand what that is all about. And it's, that's going to be very, very important for us uh, to, to figure out. Okay? Think about this very carefully. Okay, now we go on very quickly. It was uh, page 18 further. The first concrete church. Now, that's important. The concrete idea of the church came into formation. The book of Acts chapter 1 tells us it was in Jerusalem. Right? But when you look at what, how the church came together, Acts 1, what is it? This is what the Lord Jesus Christ meant, right? First prophecy, Isaiah 28. Complementary idea, Psalm 118. The word of the Lord, Matthew 16. And now we see the book of Acts. They all come together. We are seeing a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, when you take a look at the church of what it is, right? Now, this is very important. Sometimes we think prophecy is already fulfilled, done. Oh, no, no. We call this the rich fulfillment of prophecy. We call it sensuous plenial, meaning to say that as we see the church today, if it is properly built, we will actually see the continuing work of God in the church. We will continue to see prophecy not just fulfilled, but God will actually enrich the church in every possible way. All right? This is an absolutely wonderful thing. We call this uh, in, in uh, more technical language, we see the idea of the fullness of God's fulfillment. Some people see fulfillment as stop, the church started, then it's it. No, there is a richness about it. This is the richness of it all. God continues to pour His blessing even after the prophecy has been fulfilled. It continues. The church continues to be the work of the Lord Jesus. 
It continues to be marvelous in our eyes. Right? And we will not act hastily. That's how it works. Because my faith helps me to understand this correctly. Right? Now, we go on further to see how this works out. Now, this is something really wonderful to take note of. And this is the power and the person of the Holy Spirit in the midst of the church. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't see the Spirit of God at work. Right? They just, I'll do my part. If I feel like it, I'll do it. If I don't feel like it, if I, sorry, if I can't help it, I've got other things to do. That's not how the Spirit of God works. The Spirit of God came upon all the church members, and I mean all. A hundred and twenty of them formed the church, and a hundred and twenty of them were there all filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the church in its entirety, in its movement. What is the significance of the Holy Spirit's involvement? One, He is endorsing what that work of the Lord Jesus is. So when you see the Spirit of God at work, that is how he endorses that person. That's what it means. Right? So when I see the work of the Lord through Pastor Chris, then I see this idea, God is endorsing him as his servant. Obviously. Right? That I see the equipping of the church what are we doing? We are equipping. And many people will equip the church in different ways. Right? If you ask me to come and set up the AVA system, I'm a dead duck. That's not my skill. That's not my talent. I cannot do this. If you ask me to draw a design like this, I wouldn't know what to do with this. I had to, somebody had to tell me, this is Korean for I love you. I didn't know that. I, I, some of the older people are saying, hey, Pastor, you must learn to do this. I said, what is that all about? I can't. I don't. But you will be surprised how God has equipped the church. And everyone who is part of the church being equipped to help the church is part of God's plan of endorsement. We're very proud of Aldine. She came from Bethany. We may take a little bit of pride in that. <laughs> but she's the blessing of, of, of uh, the Bethel here. So that part of it, you have take pride in her, not me, because uh, we are here, here. I mean, seriously, we are just so happy. And there she is, cooking up a storm all the time. Right? There are many storms here. And uh, she's in the center of the storm. I really thank God for her. Right? And we see Pastor Chris and, uh, you know, hard at work and all that. And we see him seeking to equip. And in our heart, in our mind, we see all of these things. It is marvelous in our eyes because we have eyes to faith, of faith to see what is being done. Right? Equipping people, reaching out to people, guiding, teaching, counseling, every part of it was something new. And there we go. And there, there is the empowering. And that is something that we cannot but see. This is how the Spirit of God is involved. So the church part of it, you just think, the Father is involved. He reveals truth. The Lord Jesus is the foundation of it all. The Spirit of God is the empowering of it all. And the disciples all were part of that church. That's why the church was as strong as it was. But if we sit on the pew, we feel like serving, we serve. We don't feel like serving, sorry, I can't come. But what's this? How do we understand the church if that's what it is? 
How can the church be strong? Then the answer is, it can't. You don't stop building. That's something that I've learned. 51 years later, you don't stop building. You don't seek, don't stop seeking the empowering of the Spirit of God. Uh, that's very obvious too. That's something that we need to look at very carefully. Right? So when we look at this, all of this together, now this is how we want to see the church. And all of us must be challenged to ask ourselves, what's my part? What is your part? And we really, really thank God for all who have, um, uh, we, we try to make it a point in our church. At Easter, at our church anniversary, over at Christmas, and someone said to me, he was sitting next to me, um, you know, at the Sunday lunch at Shangri-La. And he said to me, Pastor, I, maybe twice in my life, I've ever attended a function where over 800 people will come together for the purpose of worship and um, serving the Lord together like this. He says, in all the many, many banquets I have attended, maybe I've seen only two weddings where this number of people will actually be there in function. And you, we are all doing this three times a year for the last 20-something years. Can that be done? You see, we are committed to building the church. And every Sunday, every day, we ask ourselves, how can we build the church? We've just completed one, um, you know, our church camp in March, took a break, then came Easter, and we are here. Why? We are committed because we understand the doctrine of the church. God planned this. The Lord Jesus laid the foundation with the apostles and they were committed to building the church. And once the church begins this way, that's how the church can become strong. Right? So let's take a look at these things here. So Paul wrote to the Corinthian church and he wrote to the church of God. Who are the ones who make up the composition of the church? One, and he says, sanctified in Christ. We are called saints in the sight of God. We are sanctified by the Lord. Now, this is absolutely important, right? So what happened to the Corinthian church? Unfortunately, they were not building the church. They were tearing the church apart. They were a wrecking crew. They were demolishing the church. That was the big problem in the Corinthian church. Let's take a look very quickly in 1 Corinthians church. Right? We read 1 Corinthians epistle, the, the Corinthian church. In chapter 1, it verse 10. And he wrote, that you all speak the same thing. Is it possible? That there be no divisions among you. That you should be perfectly joined together in the same mind, in the same judgment. That unity of the church was lost. What happened? The doctrine of the church was lost. The idea of understanding the church was affected adversely. And the church began to be attacked when the gates of Hades went against it. See what happens? We read, right? So there were contentions among the people. That's where it starts. Contention. Some people like, some people don't like. 
Some people say this, some people that. And the contentions begin to affect the church. Can that happen? Yes. That's what we mean by the gates of Hades. And they will <clears throat> attack. But the question is, can they prevail? And the answer is no. That is something that we want to take a look at, go on further. Right? Now, we go on further to talk about what happened uh, to all the people there. And this is important for us. In chapter 2, we see this. Of how the Spirit of God was involved. He gives wisdom to people, teaching people, revealed through His Spirit. Chapter 2, verse 10. That is the church growing. But once the church has stopped growing, and that happens a lot of times, Christians are no longer growing. They are not more, no more excited about learning great truths from the Scriptures. It's all gone. So what happens now? Chapter 3 is where we go. Okay? I could not speak to you as to spiritual people. When the church is made up of not spiritual people, the church is weakened. Go on further. You were babes in Christ. Many years Christians, but still babes in understanding, like babies. This was a weakness of the church further. Go on further. Was carnal. Not spiritual Childish, spiritually, carnality can only take milk, not solid food. Why? Because you were not able to receive it and still now not able. I am tonight feeding you with solid meat, not milk. I am saying to you that the church is God's idea, God's plan, God's concept. Prophesy, supplemented, complemented, fulfilled by the Lord Jesus himself and the apostles. And when the church started, the Spirit of God involved every single person in the church. And the church was alive and powerful. But years down the road, the Corinthian church became very divided, contentious, arguing, quarreling, finding fault, unable to grow spiritually, talking like babes, carnal in every sense of the word, behaving like mere men. There was nothing spiritual about the thing at all. That's what happens to a lot of Christians. They never grew further. And as long as the church is like this, it will never grow beyond a certain level. And that was what happened to the Corinthian church, even though that was a very sad reality. Right? So as we take a look at these things here, we have to ask ourselves what this means for us. What, how do we see the church? That it begins, this is very important. You see a complexity. It's not a simplicity. A complexity that began with God speaking through his prophets. I am going to do something wonderful. You need eyes of faith to see. If you believe, you will not act hastily. You plan your life, your actions, building something that God wants to get done. It's going to be go beyond Israel. It's going to be beyond the prophet's ministry. He is going to build what we know today as the church. And it took hundreds of years from Isaiah's time to the time of the Lord Jesus and to the disciples became apostles. The church has fallen flat on his face a long time ago. We are so divided today. We are not growing spiritually. 
We are not spirit-filled. We are not growing in our wisdom, in our knowledge, in power, and in spirit, and we don't even care. Are you deeply concerned? You ask yourself, today, am I spiritual? And if you are not spiritual, are you even concerned? If I cannot understand deeper things, I only understand basic ideas, are you concerned? Seriously. And if the church is not growing, is not building further, not able to build further, are you concerned? If we have this faith and eyes to see that the Spirit of God is upon us, we would be very greatly concerned. Now, this is something. I, we are concerned not because we are pastors, but because this is God's work. This is something that we all need to look at, and there are lots and lots of challenges. What will he do? What is the idea of God? We read, the Lord Jesus Christ said, I will build the church, meaning I will develop it. Today, we ask ourselves, will the Lord Jesus Christ train disciples first? And then after that, he made them apostles. And then after that, they built the church. That was the first century. This is the only first century. What happened to all that? It's gone. There is the church in danger today. What, what do we have? A defective view of the church. A weak view of the church. A simple understanding of the church when it should be filled with its profound complexity. There are many, many challenges. And we all have to ask ourselves, And you know, because I lead the church, I am aware of it. And I want to share this with you, and we are deeply concerned. Right? We talk about developing of a uh, diaspora church for India. And we now need to consider developing a diaspora church for Myanmar. As of today, our Bible school in Yangon is now empty. Parents want their children, those who are late teens, 20s, even up to 35, they want them out because they could be conscripted to join the army. And it's not just the National Army, it's also the Rebel Army. And we are seeing how our all Bible schools have been emptied of young people. The church is under attack. Are we concerned? So we will begin very shortly. How do we reach out to a diaspora church in Myanmar now as a development? We have to be on top of the situation. We have to be there to respond. We have to be there to say, we care. This is the church of God, whether it is in Myanmar or India. This is the church of God, and we are part of that church. If the hand is hurt, the foot cannot say, I'm not the hand. If the foot is hurt, the hand cannot say, I don't care, it's, I'm not a foot. Wherever a part of the church is hurt and affected, then the entire church must respond fully. Now that is the challenge of it all. You see, the concept of the church is that we are one. Right? And this is important. We go back to Matthew 16 and you'll see the words of the Lord Jesus and you'll see how this works out. In verse 8, verse 19, the Lord Jesus Christ said, to Peter, Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. There is tremendous authority entrusted to Peter. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. The church is part of that kingdom of heaven. Look at the work entrusted. 
Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This is figurative language, meaning to say, this is the key of authority. This is going to be entrusted to you. Do we know what to do with such responsibility given to us? You see, developing a church is not an activity. It's a responsibility. It is a responsibility that we need to pass on to the young, to the slightly older, and with the passing of time, the church can only grow stronger. But for often it is not. We don't see the complexity of it all. Right? The complexity of it all because there the gates of Hades will attack the church and we have no answer. We have weakness in the church and we have no answer. We have carnality in the church and we have no answer. We have many people who are babes in Christ and we have no answer. This is how complex the church has problems have become today. We must go back to what the Lord Jesus himself said. He said, I will develop the church. Now it's important for us. So we take a look at Pastor Chris serving with all his heart and his mind. Pastor Chris is still a fairly young man, 40-something years old, but in a few years' time, he will hit 50. And then a few more years, he will hit 60. What if there are no, nobody else who will look after the church? What will happen? The church you see today will be disintegrated, disrupted tomorrow. Where are the people who will say, you know, this is the house of God. This is the church of God. This is the church that God has taken the trouble to prophesy through his prophets to be fulfilled by the Lord Jesus and his apostles. And I want to be a part of that church because this is the work of God. I want to be there to defend the church. I want to be there to develop the church. I want to be there to do whatever I can. This I call the correct view of the church. Anything else is a defective, weak view of the church. That's the first problem. It should be our concern. Right? This is important. Our concern. You know, we tell all our children, grow up, become an engineer, become a doctor, become an accountant, become a millionaire. That's our focus. Do we tell our children, have you considered the call of God? Why would you not consider giving your life to the Lord? Where is the concern? It's hardly there. That is a very big problem. So when we do not have a right and great concern for the church, do we have even a right view of the church? That is something that we need to think about very carefully. And then finally, we must ask ourselves, do we even feel a vital connection to the church? That a lot of people don't feel a vital connection to the church. That is very important. Because Bethany's commitment to missions work is so huge. We need all the support we can get to support the Lord's work. We cannot do less. And at every major function of our church, and we send out a word to everybody, we need all the help we can get. Can the church rise up to that occasion? Then every time we look at the Easter offering or Christmas offering, the anniversary offering, we ask ourselves whether people are vitally connected to the church. 
And the answer must be a resounding yes all the time. Event after event, year after year, 51 years later, and we are even stronger. Can we do that? And our sense of commitment must be expressed not in words, but in love, in support, in every sense of the word. Right. So our young people, on Saturday, we do not have a program on a Saturday before any major event because the young people we send over to Shangri-La to work, prepare the place for Sunday. Sometimes they will take until 10 o'clock before they finish. Sometimes it will take until the next morning. Because if there is an event on that day, they can't go in until the event is done. And they go in at 11 o'clock at night. All the young people can do that. We need the young people. We need those who are technically trained to look after all that. To all the AV systems so that people can be there. But we need also to support all the churches that depend upon us for support. And we thank God for those who are able and who are willing. So Easter time comes, a huge offering that will help strengthen the Lord's work. And it's close to half a million dollars in one offering. This is the way we are vitally connected. A lot of people are willing to say, yes, I will serve here and there. When it comes to giving, stop. Unable, unwilling, but we will spend on ourselves, but not for the Lord's work. Where is the vital understanding, a correct view of the church and connection? That is something that we must seriously consider. This is where we begin. Do I understand the doctrine of the church properly in its fullness? Right? There we go. And we are trying to save as much money as we can, raise as much money as we can, get as rich as we can, buy more houses along the way, improve the, 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 the kind of cars we have, afford all the luxuries we have, that we haven't a thought about God and His work. That's how defective and weak our view of the church can end up becoming. Don't let that happen. Let's go back to God, go back to His Word, go back to the Scriptures, go back to Easter, go back to the Lord Jesus, where He said, I will build my church. The church can be wonderfully equipped to do God's work. The fullness of God's work, centuries plenty is what God wants to do. He wants to not just give the idea of the church, a concept of the church, He's going to fill it with whatever. Young people, older people, talented people, rich people, significant people, and all of us put our things together and we say we will build our church. The young people have no money, obviously. The parents help them, give them the pocket money. We don't expect anything much from them. But they have strength. They have talents. They have gifted. They are gifted people. Cannot they give their talents to the Lord? And there are those who are on the way. And they are, they are really on the way to being, making a success of their life. The challenge is, am I thinking of the Lord and of His church in my heart, in my mind? And a lot of people aren't doing that because of a defective understanding of the church. That is our challenge as we begin this, this Bible camp here. 
what is our understanding? What is the view of our church of it all? And that is important. Do we see it as the church of God? Where God is vitally involved, the Lord Jesus is the foundation, the Spirit of God reveals truth, He empowers lives, He raises up people, and everyone says, this is the work of God. It is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day of the Lord. We will rejoice in it. This is where we begin. My challenge is for us all to ask ourselves whether we have understood this along these lines. Let's think and pray together. Let's, let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we come to you confessing our weakness, our waywardness, our lack of faith, our carnality. We have taken the doctrine of the church, the church itself, too much for granted. We don't know how to love it. We don't know how to develop it. Nor for that matter, is there a real desire to build and develop it. Tonight, we ask you to begin to cleanse our hearts and our minds of this defective way of understanding the church. Help us to come alive to the reality of it all, or to become people who are responsible, people who are able to help build the church and develop it and make it strong and stronger with every passing year. We ask that you will do this special work at Bethel. Let it become a church that we know is the work of the Spirit of God in the hearts of both young and old. We pray that you will begin this work tonight in our hearts and help us to clarify and correct whatever wrong views there may be of the church. We pray that you will grant this our prayer. We pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the builder of the church. In his name we pray. Amen.